WTN News Nightly. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and join us this evening. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Colin Donovan. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Sure, you turn the light off in your eyes, but forget about your friends. <laughs> Just leave the light on in their eyes. That's fine. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's EWTN's open line Friday. Our very own vice president of theology, Colin Donovan, is in the house. Or he's in a house. He's not in our house. He's in his own house. And uh, Well, that's true. That's you know, the true way it, it's so funny because the way you've got this – camera situated um you know you you you've got <laughs> I, what i'm guessing is a is a, a small door to the attic behind you correct yeah yeah and it but it could be mistaken for like the door to the room or something and it reminds me of you know the old medieval churches where they had the tiny little doors so that people couldn't ride their horses into the building you know the marauders <laughs> couldn't uh, well you know, that's what it is. It's just that the roof, roof is sloping, so there's not really room for a full-size door, nor is there really a full-size attic. You know, somebody on Facebook I saw asked me what that sign says. Can you see it? It says warning. Right. When I was in the Navy, I was a comm officer, and we did an overhaul. And so they overhauled the mounts and everything for the high-frequency antennas, which were these huge whip antennas. And, of course, they were in proximity to where people walked back and forth. So there was a high uh, warning radio frequency radiation hazard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure there's bunches of those up at uh, up at WEWN, up at uh, yeah, the mountain. They're, they're really big. <laughs> <laughs> except, they're real, except they're really big. They're really <laughs> big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting so that really none, of, here yeah, none of the people up on the mountain look the same as they did when they started working up at the mountain. It's really an interesting phenomenon. Um, 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. People all over the world are scrambling for YouTube right now. <laughs> diving to get to their Facebook Live because they want to see what uh, we're talking about here. I'm yeah. Jack Williams. Michael McCall produces the program, and he has graciously doused the light that was in my eye so I can actually read the phone numbers now. That's kind of a bonus. And uh, your call screener is Ryan Penny and Jeff Burson, fantabulous person, is uh, taking care of our social media efforts. So if you are looking at... Uh, Colin's little horse horse rider proof door on YouTube or Facebook <laughs> Live. You can type a question into the chat window, and we may get to it by the end of the program. And our host, as he is every Friday, our very own Vice President of Theology, holed up in his undisclosed bunker with Mark Levin, uh, Colin Donovan. How are you? <laughs> Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm sure that my bunker is not as nice as his bunker, however. Yeah, probably not. You know, I don't know if you know, but uh, Charles Beery who is the producer extraordinaire yes. of Call to Communion, was the call screener for Mark Levin for a while. You're right. I had, did not know that. Yeah. I did not. And he fills in sometimes for our Mike McCall, actually. Yeah, he does. He absolutely yeah. does. So we just, you know, this is not some rinky-dink operation we got going here. This is, we, this we is got the, the big time. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, there's you and me, but besides that, it's the big time. <laughs> So we have a question here, and I think that the premise of the question may be an error, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Roby would like to know, I'm curious why the rosary is prayed counterclockwise. I, di I didn't realize you had to go one way or the other. I thought they, whichever direction you went, it always comes back to Christ, right? Yeah. You know, it, she's uh, in a certain way, she's certainly correct that I would never have thought of doing it otherwise. You know, you have this the center metal, and there might be uh, 
uh, a more prominent image on one side than the other. So it's clearly a front side because the crucifix is facing forward. And then you go around to the right. I wonder if it is the old, you know, the logic of the ancient world where left, left was Well, that, that's, sinister, that's why I do it. I, exactly. start, I start to the left myself so that I can move from the sinistre, as you would say in exactly. Italian, uh, exactly. to, uh, to the right. So, but you are a lefty, aren't you? I, I am, as you is know, my wife. There is it. You have a prejudice. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I have no, intentionality behind it, Colin. That makes up for my for my that, proclivities. You you have a good reason, and a reason qualifies a lot of things. So, uh, but no, there is no right direction, or no pun intended, or wrong direction. But yeah, it is seem to be pretty standard that people go around to the right from the center metal. Yeah. For whatever reason, that's how your mommy taught you and her taught hers taught her or whom however yeah. you learned the rosary. So you can do it that way or you can do it the right way. Um eight three three two eight eight E W T and it's only right because that's the way I do it. Um, <laughs> Raymond wants to know if the papacy is not the Antichrist, as claimed by many Protestants, who or what is? Some future uh, leader. Look at the look at the the examples from history. Um, the the archetypical Antichrist historically, or you might the type, is the Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a political leader. The Greek leader who conquered Rome, who conquered Jerusalem and tried to impose pagan cult and pagan or Greek practices on the Jews. We read about that in the book of the Maccabees, uh, uh, in the four books, if you're in some of the Eastern churches and two, if you're in the Catholic Church. And so in those books, we hear we see that story. Going forward in time, the Roman Empire, uh, based on Daniel's uh, image of the of the statue, the man, with its two branches, ultimately, the right and the left, uh, is also envisioned as the Antichrist, but particular leaders as well. So Nero and Domitian and uh, Diocletian and so on, these different emperors, especially the more pronounced uh, persecutors of the church— because the essence of being the Antichrist is to be against the people of God. And it's the political authority who does that, goes against the people of God. And so at the end of the age, the end of the world, there will be a political authority, whether it's centralized to Europe or whether it's universal and global, which sort of what you would think would be the case today, but isn't necessarily the case. And there will be a persecution of, of the church, a persecution of Christ. Because remember, the mystical Christ is Christ. And the visible sacrament of, the, of Christ is the Catholic Church. This is her teaching. Now, if you want the best arguments against why the papacy is not the Antichrist, which is largely Luther's and others' polemic, in other words, uh, a device, a rhetorical device used to uh, support their own position against the position of, of Rome. You only need read Robert Bellarmine, who gives all the reasons why the Pope cannot be the Antichrist. They would also apply to any Pope and not just the Pope of his day. So looking for Rome to be the Antichrist based on the mystical Babylon, which is at one time a real Babylon, which invaded Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, uh, exported or, or took the people away. Uh, and then the mystical Babylon of, of uh, ancient times, which St. Peter clearly speaks of as Rome or some future mystical Babylon. It's not the church. The city of the seven hills was the mystical Babylon of the of apostolic times. There will be some future mystical Babylon which persecutes the church in the same way that discrete historical individuals can be pointed to and said, ah, here is a little Antichrist, as Jesus said there would be many. Here is a little Antichrist. 
it's a Hitler, it's a Nero, it's a Mao Zedong, whoever it is that persecutes the church. That is the so that is the spirit of the Antichrist, and one day it will it will not take human form, but rather a human being will be the summation of all those those spiritual predecessors of history. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 1-833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. Your number is 1-205-271-2985. And we will put you straight to the front of the line, especially if you call from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Colin Donovan is in the house. It's EWTN's Open Line Friday with Colin. Catholic Answers Live. One of the things that we often think about in our spiritual lives is how to do something big for God. But really, most of the time, we should focus on how we can do something small for God. It's these small things that help us consecrate our ordinary daily activities and help us do everything for Jesus Christ. Catholic Answers Live, tonight, 6 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. Father Benedict Rochelle. I don't think people should have negative fears of God, but I think you should get a lump in your throat. You should feel excited. Suppose I was going to take you and introduce you to the Pope or to the president of some country or something. You might get a lump in your throat. Forget it. Every day, you, I, live and move and have our being in the presence of God. These are the class of feelings we should have, and we should have them to an intense degree if we really had the sight of Almighty God. These feelings are the feelings which we shall have if we realize His presence, and in proportion as we believe that He is present, we shall have them. And not to have them is not to realize, not to believe that God is present to us. The people you know and trust are on EWTN. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. Be sure to check out Women Made New with Kristalina Everett this Saturday, noon Eastern time. Her guest this week, man, she this girl gets guests, buddy. I'm telling you what. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, author Danielle Bean uh, will be joining Kristalina. Uh, boy, she does a good job with that, with that program. I would really encourage you to check it out. Saturday, noon Eastern time right here on EWTN Radio. We've got plenty of open phone lines for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Um, I had an email here. What did I do with it? There it is. Victor says, in the book of Acts, there are a couple of instances where people were baptized only in the name of Jesus. Why is that? Uh, there's no indication in any of those texts that that they were baptized only using Jesus' name. Uh, if nothing else, we, we say we're baptized into Christ or we're, or we're baptized into the church. Uh, we're baptized in Jesus, into Jesus. So I don't think there's any formulaic necessity there. We do have a formulaic necessity imposed on us by Christ himself in the in the last chapter of Matthew, in the last uh, uh, well, in the last chapter of Matthew, and that is, go baptize, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There is a formula. 
The others are a way of describing our insertion into Jesus, our insertion into Christ, our insertion into his passion, death, and resurrection. So you find all of those discussions of baptism in relationship to that, a theological relationship, an explanation and, and terminology to express what is happening in baptism. You find in Matthew the one instance, the one instance, which is... Uh, an actual formula of baptism. And we also know it because this formula is preserved in all the churches until some began to use other, have other explanations of baptism and to say either it wasn't required or is merely spiritual or some other explanation that departs from the historical explanation of Christianity, East and West, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. And so this is, uh, this is clear. And so that lengthy tradition affirms what is already patently uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free telephone number, 833-288-3986. Unfettered access to a professional theologian at 833-288-EWTN. All right, here's a good question from Lee. She wants to know, is, is Catholicism compatible with socialism? The, uh, the church's encyclicals say that it is not. Socialism as a state, is, is a, you might say, a status kind of economic system, economic and political. And it's, you know, back and forth. In some cases, it's simply an economic view. In other cases, it's in, enforced with varying degrees, in which case we might speak of, you know, we might speak of uh, communism, we might speak of Stalinism, and that is sort of the degree of autocracy with which socialism is enforced in a country and so on. But the basic principle of socialism is that the decisions are made in view of the overall good of the state. And that means that the private rights of individuals don't count so much. When the church began to address this with Pope Leo XIII and the social encyclicals, because it was a new idea, if you think of Marx and, and the other socialist ideas that came up, Hegel in the end of the uh, 19th century, the church had to address these rather immediately because this sounds like a great thing. Oh, you know, split and divide everything to everybody and everything will work out. And so we, this is the way of solving poverty and so on and so forth. There is not an example of the actual practice of socialism, of course, which demonstrates the truth of that optimistic viewpoint. But what socialism does do is it deprives people of their human rights. So Leo XIII pointed out in all of the uh, encyclicals since then and all of the discussions up to Centesimus Annus of John Paul II, note the fact that in socialism you're deprived, for example, of private property. The state feels quite free to come in and take your private property in order to uh, advance uh, its, its own goals, uh, whatever those might be. Uh, the effect is, in the very worst examples, there are mild examples, there are extreme cases of it. The very worst example of, of, uh, of communism, for example, is that uh, essentially, you know, private property probably consists of your clothes on your back and what you have in your little tiny apartment. And beyond that, the government feels perfectly free to utilize whatever else is yours. Now, the other extreme, of course, is that there is no social uh, obligation on the part of people. And the church is entirely against that view as well. We have obligations of charity and solidarity with other people. We're obliged to have care for the poor preferentially, as a number of popes have said so. And to do all of this without a regime of socialism that obliges it through the power of the state. Because once the state feels that it has that right, what does it do next? It wants to control not only your property, but your thoughts. Because your thoughts are straying from the reservation when you decide that, well, no, I have a right to this. Why are you taking this from me? Why are you confiscating what is mine, what I worked for? 
And so there is a real tension between the social impulse in man, which is confirmed by revelation, which is part of our nature, the obligation of charity, which is a specifically Christian obligation, and then the rights of the individual. Now, for the most part, uh, that's resolved in democracy, where you get the, you know, the majority of people saying, we need certain levels of taxation, we need soldiers for our army, and so on. And people are generally agreed in that, and so people are you know, employed in the military, their taxes are taken for good purposes, and so on. But then that can also drift into the extreme where how people people's lives and the control of them are largely at the behest of the government. And they're all done, it's all done for good intentions and purposes. And that's the incipient danger in socialism is that you start off mildly for the sake of the common good and you end up uh, strongly putting the emphasis on the rights of the state to decide and organize the economic and the private sphere, the sphere of conscience and the sphere of uh, the sphere of public action wants to control all of those things. And that's where it drifts. So you can't admit the principle, but you can encourage and especially among Christians to fulfill all the social obligations, which could freely accomplish the very same thing. Our trouble is our fallen human nature, and sometimes people come along and they think people aren't going to do this on their own. We're going to take what is theirs. We're going to redistribute it, and then the problem is solved. There is no country where we can point to where socialism has solved the problems of inequality or inequity. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833 833- Two eight eight three nine eight six. First up is Mark in Houston, Texas, listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Mark, you're on with Colin Donovan. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Sure, Mark. Um, I wanted to know the difference, and I, uh, my wife would probably tell me, just look it up yourself, but I said, this guy knows <laughs> what I'm talking about. I'm going to call him up. So uh, the difference between doctrine, dogma, and speaking from the chair of Peter and I've also heard, this is kind of a lengthy thing, but they've also mm-hmm. heard, you know, the Immaculate Conception is a dogma, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, and could you could you tell me some other dogmas also? And that, that's my question. Oh, uh, that the, the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ present sacramentally under the forms of bread and wine. There's a dogma for you. And how about doctrine? And that's the okay. Doctrine. Well, okay, uh, I have to start at the beginning. That which the church believes to be true, that's doctrine. It's teaching from the from the Greek word. So we see that that's the the root of it. So the entirety of what the church teach believes and teaches is doc, doctrine. Some of that be, is made into a dogma not because the church decides we need to distinguish between doctrine A and doctrine B, but because somebody comes along and says, well, I can accept doctrine A, but doctrine B is wrong or not true. And the church has to ramp up its authority. And it does that usually progressively over time. It doesn't jump to making a doctrine into a dogma, you know, just for the heck of it. Over time, it usually progressively raises that authority. But once a council or a a council takes it up, and so a a good example and the most recent example of a council where actually a dogma was defined is the Council of of, of Trent and Vatican I. In Vatican I, uh, the dogma of papal infallibility and the circumstances governing that was was uh, defined, as well as papal primacy, which is the governance authority of the Pope, and that was defined. Uh, So those are two dogmas, but it's not like in, you know, 1869, the church didn't believe that the Pope could declare a dogma, the infallibility, or in 1869, the church didn't believe that universally around the world, the Pope had authority everywhere and not just in the Diocese of Rome, but that 
it was contested. Of course, obviously, the Protestants had contested it, but it was being contested in the 1800s, especially in Germany and in other places, and that came up. And so it was felt necessary to declare those doctrines as dogmas. So so anything in doctrine is potentially capable of being made a dogma. But the church doesn't make dogmas just to make a dogma. It usually has a reason, and it usually gets there by a process of an increasing, you know, increasing of authority. So that's the difference between the two. Now, one one way, so that's doctrine versus dogma. Dogma is a doctrine. All doctrines are not declared as dogmas. All doctrine is to be believed, however. That's an important point to make. The other point is that papal infallibility refers to the power of the Pope under certain circumstances, as Vatican I defined, to do making of that dogma. A council can make it in union with the Pope. A Pope can make it by himself. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Open line Friday with Colin Donovan. Teresa Tamio. It's our goal to help each and every listener take this beautiful faith of ours out into the public square with great ideas on making a difference through engaging the culture. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. And this is an EWTN bookmark brief. I'm Doug Keck. Just had the pleasure of speaking with my friend and EWTN host Raymond Arroyo about his latest work, Will Wilder, The Amulet Power. So, Ray, tell us about this particular story and how it fits into the whole Will Wilder case. I wanted to tell a story and create a series for middle grade kids, and that's from really six to about 13 or 14, that told the story of an entire family on the adventure. In this book, Will encounters a relic, as he does in every book, uh, and it is the locks of Samson, a relic with the mm -hmm. locks of Samson that gives him this superhuman strength. All sorts of interesting and unintended consequences spill from that decision to snatch the relic and use it for his own ends. But he learns a lot, and family secrets start spilling out. The book Will Wilder, The Amulet of Power, you, is book three in the series, available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. And this has been an EWTN Bookmark Brief. Thanks for stopping by. This is Father Mitch Pacwa. Let us pray for an end to the coronavirus. Lord, we pray that you protect our most vulnerable citizens. We pray for our courageous doctors and nurses and other healthcare folks, that you would protect them and keep them strong in their service. And we pray for our scientists, that they might find a great cure to save many lives. For your greater glory, praise, and honor. Amen. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Later today on Catholic Answers Live, a very basic question. Does God exist? With Pat Flynn. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to Open Line with Colin Donovan. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Plenty of time for your phone calls at 833 833- 288-3986. We're talking to Mark in Houston, Texas. And Colin, you were kind of finishing up the whole papal infallibility yeah. notion. That, that's right. The idea that uh, uh, a dogma as the supreme act of declaring something that is a doctrinal truth to be with certainty infallibly revealed, and that's some, a feature of it, it's infallibly revealed is done in two contexts, and that is when a council gathered together, such as the Council of Trent or the First Vatican Council, declares a subject to be a uh, dogma of the church, and typically, but not with, I don't think, any necessity, but typically it also says, let those who are, or language to this effect, that you that this is obliged of Catholics or Christians, it actually uses to be believed. Um, if not, then let them be anathema. So that's uh, the expression. Anathema sit is commonly used as the penalty for disbelieving uh, Catholics, disbelieving a dogma of the church. 
So that can be done by a council. And now a council has no authority apart from a pope. But it's the idea is that when the pope and the council agree on this, you have the entire apostolic college. Just as in the first century, you had Peter and the apostles. When the pope and the council agree in totally, then it's you have the entire apostolic college declaring this a dogma. The pope has a unique authority to do that. You, independent of the council, very seldom independent of the bishops, because what they do is they take something that's already a doctrine. They usually consult rather broad, broadly in the case of the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. Letters were written to the bishops, you know, do, you know, do the, the bishops concur that this is timely or whatever the pope might say in there. And then at the end of it, the pope exercises uh, his authority. So there, there is that unique authority of the Pope to, to declare from the chair of Peter, that's the ex cathedra part, from, this, from the chair of authority of Peter, uh, to declare something, a, uh, a dogma. And we have the two instances of, of the Immaculate Conception, and we have the instance, obviously, of the Assumption by Pius XII in 1950. I would say that it's not limited to those because also if you look at what Pope John Paul II said in Evangelium Vitae in, in declaring that sins against the fifth commandment are grave sins, and in particularly abortion and euthanasia are grave sins, uh, that that is, that is now a dogma. Uh, not in quite the way, but the language is used there uh, that would give it that weight. And like I was saying uh, to the caller, it's not as if the day before it was all right to kill your fellow man or babies or uh, the elderly as they're dying, but in the day after it wasn't. It's that it is written to that point where the church, it was necessary for John Paul II to make it absolutely clear to Catholics that abortion, euthanasia, and murder of the innocent generally since that's his starting point, the fifth command, murder of the innocent, and then abortion and euthanasia is two instances of it, that that is against divine law and gravely sinful. So that would be considered an example. And there is other, another example, and it's probably the most common example. The common opinion of theologians is that every canonization is ex cathedra. In other words, from the chair the Pope says, by my, by the authority of Saints Peter and Paul, and by my own, I declare that Pope John Twenty Third is in heaven, and the Christian faithful are commanded, are commanded to venerate him, or to take the other end of the spectrum that John Paul II is in heaven, and the faithful are commanded. There is very strong language used in every. Uh, every canonization that gives all, um, uh, you know, is totally implying the ex cathedra declaration, because not only is it saying that we believe now with faith that this person is in heaven, but that the faithful are commanded. So it's not only the exercise of the Pope's charism of infallibility, but it's the exercise of his supreme governance to command people to venerate the individual. And so that may actually be the most common case. We wouldn't call that a dogma, but it's taking a historical fact and declaring it to be true and even divinely revealed that this person in is in heaven. On the basis of the reason process by which the individual was canonized and on the basis of the miracle, which is God's affirmation of the church's earthly decision. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Still a couple of open phone lines at 833-288-3986. Next stop, Saginaw, Michigan. Paul's a first-time caller listening on Ave Maria Radio. Paul, you're on with Colin Donovan. Well, thank you, sir, for taking my call. Sure. Um, I'm uh, a Catholic that's come back to the church, and I um, uh, fire inside me is burning really, uh, really hot. Um, I've walked the abortion line three or four times in the past year, and I've mingled with different people, and I've watched what's going on in politics. 
And I, I wonder how people can vote in good conscience for, for candidates and mm-hmm. parties that are pro-abortion. Yeah. They don't have a well-formed conscience. <laughs> Well, that I was going to say that that question is the 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 question of the day, isn't it? Um, you know, the church has a lot of tolerant of people's personal decisions. That's certainly true, but it also gives us guidelines about what's the most important policies and issues uh, that face us. Uh, and in the in church teaching, this is all of, by the way, all of this is on our uh, EWTN.com. If you go to the voting page, you will find a lot of material on, on these factors and these elements from the church's uh, moral theology tradition. And it's quite clear that, in, that there are issues that are paramount because they are the most central issues of human existence, first of which is life. Then we have the issue of marriage. Uh, Then we have the issues directly related to that. Then we have issues that are matters of policy. How are we going to, say, provide uh, care for the poor, health care for the sick? And there can be different approaches, and many of them are practical debates. They're not moral debates. Nobody wants to, you know, kick people to the curb and see them die, but there are debates about how to accomplish that in a society without doing what your previous caller asked about the socialist solution, which is confiscate everybody's property and redistribute it. That's the socialist solution. The capitalist solution on the extreme end is basically, you know, you know, make as much money as you want and that's the end of it. There is some Christian way in the middle to do accomplish those same things. So people look at the voting issues often as a battle between two extremes and that is the one extreme which is all about the policy issues and the other extreme which is all about the uh the the life issues and the essential issues so what what the church has said and the clearest statement of this is uh you could you can see it in the tradition under the the idea of a principle of double effect John Paul II talks about it in Evangelium Vitae with respect to legislators who say, you know, well, there are two bills, say there's two bills that promote abortion. One one bill is, you know, up till birth. I think we've actually had some of those. Uh, The other bill says, well, life and health of the mother. Does the legislator take the I'm not voting for either of these positions or knowing that at least one of them is going to get uh, uh, chosen, vote for the least damaging to the society of them. And he explains how you're not voting for the damaged, the damage that the least will present, but you're voting that the other one be prevented. So on that basis, people can vote for somebody that is defective in their views, but they judge to be preventing something worse to happen. Now, here's the problem, and that is, what are the most important issues? And we go back to what I said initially. The central issues and the issues which the church describes in her teaching have to do with the things most close to human life and the common good. The other policy issues people can be, and frankly, I I don't understand how people can uh, make the choices that you allude to either. Uh, but you know, I think they try they they try to justify it based on Catholic teaching. And hopefully, before God, their subjective consciences are not at fault for doing, as Jack said, simply not looking at this too closely and simply voting. And this is a danger for everybody. You get into the, you know, I vote for this party. No, you should vote for candidates who will support the truth. Uh, 
And if that means opposing a candidate who is far worse, then you do that. But I think I, I think it's difficult to understand with the life issues, with the marriage issues, uh, the logic of voting for uh, some of the candidates that Catholics vote for. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Next up is CC in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. CC, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my question regards astrology and mm-hmm. if it's... Um, if it's acceptable or not acceptable for Catholics or Christians to uh, seek out any answers or seek out any information with astrologers. And the second part of that is, um, can you give me a quick summary of what the, the saying as above, so below means? And is, and is it a, an occult philosophy? Um, well, uh, I think the two are connected. The part of it is, first of all, scientifically in the past, people believed that the the stars in that did exercise a role in human in human life. Um, I mean, we know scientifically that that's that's not the case. But we know also that God used that common belief in the ancient world, for instance, with the star of Bethlehem. Uh, to lead to Christ. But in and of itself, it was not the end and it wasn't a truth because that was use on God's part. But it's an idea that persisted into the Middle Ages and only, I think, with modern uh, scientific astronomy and physics did we realize uh, the absurdity of such a view as what happens above in the stars is has out of effect here on the Earth. So the church concludes that to in the face of that actual reality, as opposed to what the ancients supposed, to believe that a purely material thing has this effect apart from God's will on the life of the person is a form of of idolatry. Uh, In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you can look this up in the section on the Ten Commandments, under the First Commandment, you shall have no other gods before you. In other words, it's against the First Commandment to seek out the future or truths of that nature about myself or others or whatever by astrology, by palmistry, by mediums, by numerology, and by any of these means which assert that there is some so almost mechanical connection between the positions of the stars or the lines on one's hand or the markings in one's eyes or any of these systems uh, that can be the cause of your daily reality. There are two causes of your daily reality. God and his providence and your own will and the choices. Everything else is outside of you. Even the negative things that happen to you, the bad things that happen to you, is other people making bad choices that impact you. But the only overarching causes, universal causes of your life, are you and God. You can influence God through prayer, through the intercession of Our Lady and the saints, Uh, And you can make your daily choices and so on about what you want to do based on your own well-informed conscience. But the planets and these other efforts to divine, as it were, uh, are are against uh, against the faith. And we see it. We see that in the in the in the books of Kings, where uh, where uh, Saul goes to divine Samuel, who has died. To, to try to raise him up to get the an idea of his own future. And, and that was totally forget for, forbidden. And because of that, call, Saul died in battle. This was God's punishment on divination. But yet, 
that despite being told by God, the Jewish people would keep going back to the high places where the fertility gods and the pillars and the different things were set up for, you know, for by the Canaanites and others. They kept doing that and they had to be kept being reminded and told. Likewise, Christians sometimes think that the appeal to astrology or, or, or to a medium or these kinds of things uh, is going to relieve their anxiety about the future. No, prayer will relieve the anxiety about the future, not astrology or anything of that nature. So it is sinful and also it's pointless. What about the phrase, as above, so below? Well, that was what I was saying first. It, it, it comes from... Uh, it comes from the ancient idea that, uh, you know, we're basically our destiny is controlled. And we know that's not it is controlled by God. So if you're as above as God, you're you're on good ground uh, because his will will be done. 833-288-EWTN is our toll free number. 833-288-3986. Uh, still plenty of time for your phone calls. Um, I don't know about you, Colin. I like to hold a newspaper in my hand. It's kind of hard to come by those papers nowadays. And actually, even the ones that still do print it aren't printing anything fit to read. But uh, one exception to that rule mm -hmm. is the National Catholic Register. Uh, check it That's out. Right. It's a division of uh, EWTN. Uh, they still put out a print edition that they'll mail to your home a couple times a month. And um, they have plenty of online content in addition to that. And they'll even make you a special offer of six free, edition, six free issues of the print edition. Just uh, check it out at ncregister.com. Next up is Paul in Kansas City, Missouri, listening to the Catholic Radio Network. Paul, you're on with Colin Donovan. Oh, oh hello, um, Colin. No, I'm from Kansas sure. City, Kansas. Oh. Hey, I got um, I wanted your opinion on something. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I heard you talking about the post infallibility and mm -hmm. um, things. Um, I, I, the reason why I'm calling you and the reason why I'm telling you this is because I I I I got discernment from God and I just think that the church has got a lot of things wrong throughout the history about naming saints. I believe you know a lot of them were satanic deceptions, and that God and that He fools people with real saints with counterfeit saints. Okay, so that's your question. Um, uh, our, our call screener mentions you talked about being skeptical of Padre Pio. You know, you're absolutely true uh, in, in this sense, and that is that throughout history, people have been deceived by the evil one as an angel of light. And so, for instance, in France in the 1700s, I believe it was, there was an entire monastery where possession was ramp rampant in the monastery of nuns. Uh, obviously a very profound uh, 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 delusion there. But the church has the means of dis distinguishing. So in aesthetical and mystical theology, there are the tools, uh, the doctrines and so on, uh, with Aquinas and John of the Cross and Trees of Avila and other, uh, other of the spiritual doctors. Uh, to make that discernment. Now, obviously, if you're talking about a person who's not a, a blessed or a saint or doesn't have a cause for canonization, you know, people have opinions. The purpose of the of the cause for canonization is to sort through those opinions and to demonstrate, first of all, it's not about the phenomena. You've made a mistake in judging that sainthood is about phenomena. There are many saints who had no phenomena connected with their lives other than their profound relationship with God manifested through a life of heroic virtue. So the very first thing the church does is collect information about the life of the individual. Was it heroically virtuous? And so in Padre Pio or, or, or any other saint's case, it rigorously does that pro and con. You know, so how did this person live? How did they react? How did they re respond to success? How did they respond to failure? All the things that manifest the presence of the spirit working in them and having determined that at a local level, wherever it started out in some 
diocese or some religious family, community like the Franciscans, having determined that, it goes to Rome. And the same process goes over again, a thorough investigation of that. I think in Padre Pio's case, just to illustrate the point, there are multiple volumes. Uh, uh, I remember seeing a picture long ago of the volumes as they were being prepared for for shipping to Rome from San Giovanni Rotundo when it was, uh, you know, it was like a shelf full of books. All of these showing, you know, accounts of people who are alive who were knew him, accounts of uh, claims, things he said, things he did, and so on and so forth. So the life is examined. And reasonable people who are knowledgeable in the faith and what holiness constitutes holiness determined here was something where here was a life of holiness and they sent it on. They didn't consider whether his stigmata were real. They didn't consider whether his flying through the air was real. They didn't, excuse me, they didn't consider any of those phenomena uh, at all. They knew about them, obviously. So they considered all of this life, and then it goes on. And if the answer is yes, the person can be beatified, if Rome's answer. And how does Rome do it? Theologians study it. The Congregation of Saints votes on it. The Pope reviews it, and he concludes this is, this is true. Then he can order that this person be beatified. But what they need before that takes place is a miracle. And this is what I was alluding to. Not only is the human effort to investigate the life, and that's the most important one. You don't pass that. You can be, you know, uh, you see in the in the Marvel movies, people sort of moving stuff around almost magically. You know, that's not what, if that's the basis, then, you know, you can get an occultist to do that kind of thing. No, they have to distinguish between the true and the false. They do that, the life. Then they look to see, is there a miracle? Is it beyond natural explanation? Is the explanation beyond the power of the angels? Because obviously you have good angels and bad angels. And if the power, and if it's beyond the power of the angels, it's the power of God at work. That's the demonstration of God's authentication of that. So then it does it all over again, at least on the miracle side, for canonization. And only then does the Pope, exercising his charism of infallibility, declare that the person is with God and command that they be venerated. And so it's not just the Pope speaking. He gave his authority to Peter. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And not only is it the God speaking through the Pope or Christ speaking through the Pope, it's God speaking directly, healing people in ways that even modern science can't explain. So John 23rd, I used that one. This is to me a marvelous story. A nun in a hospital whose stomach had been removed because of cancer. She couldn't eat. She was obviously withering away. Her sister brought her a holy card of, uh, I think, I don't know if he was yet blessed, uh, John 23rd, got her a holy card and said, let's pray this together. And they prayed it a number of times and she sort of forgot about it. And then one day she saw this, uh, what was clearly the Pope standing at the foot of her bed. And she got suddenly felt hungry and she called for food and she ate it and she's eating. She continued to eat. She has no stomach and they investigated it. She has no stomach. She eats and without a stomach. That's a, a miracle that can't be explained naturally. Colin, we are flat out of time. Have a great weekend. You too. On behalf of our host, Colin Donovan, producer Michael McCall, call screener Ryan Penny, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. I hope each and every one of you have a terrific weekend. Back at it Monday with John Martinoni. Until then, God bless.